I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'm reading the chat and, and I'm seeing this great comment from uh, Elizabeth uh, McDowell at eight, six, 37 minutes past the hour. I cycled wildly from ADHD whack-a-mole and then waves of just dot, 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 almost overwhelming good. Does that make any sense? Someone asked, what is ADHD whack-a-mole? You know, whack-a-mole is a game where, you know, different things pop up and you're trying to get them down and you're chasing one thing after another. Anyway, yeah, that's very natural, very natural. Um, I think with training, though, the mind gradually gets quieter and it's able to settle in and, and recovers from distraction. I do think there's a natural tendency, um, this is my personal theory, that the brain metabolizes little, you know, sugars and other fuels, uh, and it fatigues. And so when the clarity uh, metabolizes and it runs out of metabolic supplies, then we kind of wander off a little bit. Meanwhile, that which is centering inside us that's supported by our brain kind of reestablishes its little supplies and then we kind of come back in again. So a very useful thing to pay attention to is when we tend to, when concentration tends to decay, when do we go off? And you can see that in everyday life in a business meeting or a conversation with someone, when do you tend to wander off? Meditation, it becomes really clear when you wander off. One, that's one thing that's very helpful about it. And so it's really interesting to observe. For many people, it's that transition around the fourth to sixth breath in a row, third to fifth breath in a row. Right around there is when the um, sustained presence of mind decays. We lose it. So if you can just get through that, that little moment there around the fourth, fifth, or sixth breath, more or less, often, um, then you're more stable on the other side. And with practice, you get more and more used to just hanging in there, which is useful in meditation because then you can deepen your insight into yourself, and it's very useful in everyday life too. Staying present, breath after breath. Okay. Uh, so I would like to continue to explore with you the seven factors of awakening. And if you're new to that material, uh, this is a list in Buddhism that's very psychological, very common sense, and in which the Buddha basically said, if you're interested in awakening, develop, cultivate, stabilize, integrate, blend these seven factors and per perfect them. And that will really help you move toward your own liberation of mind and heart, the highest happiness, which is peace. So the seven R's I mentioned previously, mindfulness, investigation, energy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And I'm missing one that will come to, oh, bliss, da-da. Mindfulness, investigation, uh, energy, bliss, joy, rapture, number four, tranquility, and then concentration and equanimity, the seven. So now I'd like to explore with you what is, of course, very close to my heart as a therapist and someone who's spent a, gotten a lot of value out of um, becoming more self-aware, investigation. Uh, Joseph Goldstein, I heard him asked one time, in all his years of practice and very serious practice, what's one thing that really has been useful for him? He paused and he said, curiosity. That's a kind of investigation. Uh, it's also said that of the seven, investigation, which might seem so pedestrian, so yeah, boring, is actually the most important of all. So the Word for this in Pali, investigation, has the word dhamma in it. It's basically investigating the dhammas, which are essentially phenomena 
and teachings about phenomena. So we're investigating phenomena and we're also exploring wisdom about them. Foundational to this is what I said was one of my personal top five uh, favorite uh, suttas or sutras that have come down to us from early Buddhism. And this is the Buddha's discourse to the Kalamas. And I'm actually going to read it to you. Uh, somebody may be able to find it and drop it into the chat. You don't need to. This is the famous Kalama, K-L-A-M-A, -A, Sutta, which is in the Anguttara Nikaya 3.65. So here we go. Ready? Uh, so the Kalamas, and I'm reading just a portion of the Sutta, uh, the Kalamas, who were inhabitants of Kesaputta, sitting on one side, they came to visit the Buddha. They said to the Blessed One, There are some monks and Brahmins, venerable sir, who visit Kesaputta, where we live. They expound and explain only their own doctrines. The doctrines of others they despise, revile, and pull to pieces. Sounds like political TV. Some other monks and Brahmins too, venerable sir, come to Kesaputta. They also expound and explain only their own doctrines. The doctrines of others they despise, revile, and pull to pieces. Venerable sir, there is doubt among us. There is uncertainty in us concerning them. Which of these reverend monks and Brahmins spoke the truth? and which spoke falsehood. How do we know who to believe? It, which implies as well, how do we know to believe you, O Buddha? Right? The Buddha replied. He said, it is proper for you, Kalamas, to doubt, to be uncertain. Uncertainty has arisen in you about what is indeed doubtful. Come, Kalamas, do not go upon what has been acquired by repeated hearing nor upon tradition, nor upon rumor, nor upon what is in a scripture, nor upon surmise, nor upon an axiom, nor upon specious reasoning, nor upon a bias towards a notion that has been pondered over, nor upon another's seeming ability, nor upon the consideration, this person is our teacher. Columnists, when you yourselves know these things are bad, these things are blamable, these things are censured by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to harm and ill, then Columnists abandon them. On the other hand, come. Kalamas, do not go upon what has been acquired by repeated hearing, nor upon tradition, nor upon rumor, etc., etc. Kalamas, when you yourselves know these things are good, these things are not blamable, these things are praised by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to benefit and happiness. Then, Kalamas, enter on and abide in them. It's hard to find a similar teaching at the foundation of any other spiritual tradition in the world. Maybe there are bits there. I'm quite open to discovering that in the Quran or the older New Testament. Certainly, I'm, I'm sure in the teachings of the indigenous people uh, around the world may well be this kind of uh, humility and empiricism. But among the major religions, other than Buddhism, I'm not so sure. Isn't it beautiful? The Buddha basically said to them directly, don't believe a word I say on mere belief. Don't just take it on faith because I've got charisma, the Buddha. Just see for yourself. Explore for yourself what leads to happiness, what leads to harm, what stands the test over time, and what doesn't. And on the basis of that, come to your own conclusions.
for yourself based on your own investigations. So we have right there in this fundamental teaching that establishes the role of the teacher um, who basically says, don't just take it on faith about me, test it in your own life. Explore it for yourself. Grab hold of it and see how it turns out for you. Right there, we have the investigation factor of awakening. Look for yourself. See for yourself. We were talking um, before we began formally tonight, George and I, about what's one way to get out of your own way. And I said, well, one way is to trust yourself wisely trust yourself. And here the Buddha is saying to us, don't trust me. <laughs> the, the, the Buddha says, don't trust me, the Buddha. What? He says, trust yourselves. You know, yeah, listen to what I say and then investigate it and see for yourself what works for you. Right there is a question for you. How much do you encourage yourself to investigate and to find what you can trust yourself, you know? And have there been times in your life, there certainly have been for me, I was in half a cult, I think of it, in my 20s for about three years. I grew a lot through it and I learned a lot about cults <laughs> in the process. But anyway, you know, had there been times in your life when you, you know, you overtrusted some doctrine, some catechism, some charismatic guru type, and you didn't trust your yourself enough. And um, what's it feel like to really claim for yourself the right to see what you see and care about what you care about and come to your own conclusions? It's completely foundational. And this basic foundational orientation has enabled Buddhism, for example, to be very harmonious with the foundation of empiricism and investigation uh, and you know, being able to replicate a finding that's foundational to the scientific tradition. So there's been a lot of harmony at the roots of these two approaches. So what I'd like to explore with you now is seven kinds of investigation uh, that are in the Dhamma, in the Dharma, in the teachings of the Buddha, and um, I'm kind of bringing together, bringing them together in my own way. Okay. So the first of these is to, and I, let me actually create a frame here. There's plenty to investigate in the outer world. There's plenty to investigate in our own biology. I'm going to talk about investigations of consciousness, of experiencing, the streaming of consciousness, the flow of phenomenology. That's what I'm going to explore here with you. Thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions, desires images, memories, um, patterns that persist in the mind. That's what I'm talking about here. So first of these, the first investigation uh, is the layering, is the depth and breadth of your own experiences. You know, bringing awareness to body sensations, bringing awareness to emotions, bringing awareness to inclinations, desires, longings, bringing awareness to thoughts and the layering of thoughts, bringing awareness to the younger material that underlies the more adult structures and layers, you know, in the construction of the psyche, essentially from the bottom up. You know, that also involves an awareness of just the complexities, the psychodynamics, as Freud talked about, inner conflict, different parts like we have in Gestalt therapy or archetypal psychology from Jung or modern versions, internal family systems, very well developed by Richard Schwartz, uh, parts of yourself, just the whole zoo. That's one investigation. You know, What are the many multitudes that make you who you are? Okay. Second is really looking at what helps and what hurts. Where is their happiness? Being aware of beautiful, uh, pleasurable, enjoyable qualities in your own mind. Oftentimes, we're so busy these days, 
stressed and rushing, that we don't notice those little moments where for three or two or one second even in a row, ha, ah, there's a pause, there's a settling. You know, you see a person's face and you can see a nobility in their face as you walk past them on the street. Ah, do you slow for that? You look at your own face in the mirror and you go, you look tired, Rick. Because <laughs> I'm working a lot these days. And, you know, maybe you look in your own face and you see something that's worthy there. Can you slow it down for those few seconds to really appreciate that? Can you see happiness? Can you see love? Can you see courage? Can you see steadfastness, steadfastness, you know, endurance, perseverance? Similarly, can you see sorrow? Can you recognize suffering? Can you see pain? Can you see harms? Can you see ill will? Can you see reactivity? Um, I shared earlier that, um, you know, in the before we really started that sometimes people need to regulate themselves better, you know, and I observed in myself arising around someone who wasn't very regulated, just a lot of anger um, and intensity about it. Can you see that in yourself when it comes up? So this is the second investigation. You know, first investigation is sort of the layering and the complexities, the parts of your own mind. Second is starting to differentiate, notice differences. Oh, this feels good, that feels bad. Um, this feels good at first, but then it feels bad. You know, being, being aware and exploring that sort of thing. The word um, in Pali for that which is skillful is kusala. And kusala comes from a, a sharply edged grass that cuts through. That which is skillful cuts through our entanglements, cuts through our delusions, you know, leads us onward. Can we recognize that? Those things that are kusala rather than akusala, which means unskillful. Uh, if you see the letter A in front of a Pali word or typically Sanskrit as well, it means the negation of that. Akusala is unskillful. So that's the second one, you know. What feels good, what feels bad, what seems helpful, what seems harmful. Third investigation, now we're getting deeper and deeper, is observing change. The Buddha said um, that one who truly understands impermanence, truly understands it, understands the whole of the Dharma. Wow. So things change. They have a dynamism to them. Even if there's a stability, that stability is quivering, vibrating, pulsing, fizzing. I think of the effervescent surface of reality continuously is like the surface of a glass of uh, soda water, club soda, you know, bubbling continuously. Uh, process, investigating processes, verbs. Uh, you may know that uh, in the language of Pali, the foundation of early Buddhism, and in some other languages, um, things are described as gerunds. It's not so much a dog, it's dogging. It's not so much a tree, it's treeing, it's ricking, it's georging, right? It's Elena-ing. Um, so that's a third major investigation. And the brain tends to lock onto forms. It tends to operate in terms of nouns, but reality is a vast network of verbs, <laughs> a vast relational field of processes. So that's a third major investigation. Impermanence, dynamisms, changes, processes. Okay. Which then, then leads us to the, force, to the fourth investigation. In these processes, which require change for process to occur, there are causes and effects. There are cue balls and eight balls, <laughs> hammers and nails, right? Uh, bats and balls. Uh, and so what we can observe uh, is what are the factors, for example, that lead to greater happiness and what leads to greater harm? Uh, what are the results? What happens 
when you contract around your point and bang it home with a critical edge. Something I've you know done in my life at least once. Uh, what happens then? You know what happens when you say to yourself, "Oh, just one beer, one glass of wine is fine," and then toward the end of that first one, you think, "You know, another one would be really nice." And after that, you're like, "Yeah, let's go for it. I'm two beers in. Might as well keep going." Or, you know, two bars of chocolate in. Let's keep going. And what are the causes there? And can you look back and appreciate the famous proverb, um, you know, person takes drink, drink takes drink, drink takes person. You can see the causal flow. Uh, you can see what happens in relationships when you just literally let it rip and uh, don't repair later or at all. Um, causes and effects. Very fundamental. That observation, especially of craving, the contraction, the pressuring, the in the selfing in craving, the contracting, the insisting or pressuring, and the selfing. These are these three very clear experienced indicators of more or less craving. You know, being very mindful of that process and observing what happens when you let that process carry you away. <clears throat> Craving will arise, certainly until full awakening and irrevocable awakening. Perhaps even then craving arises, but it doesn't have any traction. But along the way, we can be very mindful of the, you know, the contraction in the body often, the insisting, the mustness, and the sense of me, myself, and I in craving, and then increasingly release it right there, right at the tipping point, so we don't get sucked into that which causes suffering and harm. That's real-time investigating of the engine of craving and whew, whew, releasing from it. How's your investigation of craving these days? For me, it's absolutely one of the most useful things of all to become more and more granularly aware of, closer and closer to real time. And then fifth investigation. It's on the next page. Ah, uh, yes. One of the big ones. Investigating the apparent self. Wow. You know, this presumed entity that's always just around the corner in the mind. You turn your head, you, you can never quite catch a glimpse of all that it is presumed to be, right? Can you observe the increasing or decreasing of the sense of self, of taking things personally, of getting identified with something, with getting possessive around something, with feeling affronted, to feeling indignant, how dare you, all of that. Can you, be, can you be aware of how that increases and decreases? That's an investigation. Uh, can you be aware of the factors that tend to drive an increase in the sense of self? Notably, a sense of threat or a sense of opportunity or a sense of relatedness with another person. Right. That's a fantastic investigation. And in that investigating, can you investigate the fact that you'll never find the full presumed self in the mind, ever? All you will find are um, intimations of a self, presumptions of a self. But is there ever that actual unified, enduring, and independent? These are the three constituting presumed conditions of a self, right? Unified, there's just one self. Second, um, it's enduring. It's the same self today that it was 10 years ago or 50. 
And it's independent. Things happen to the self, but the self is independent of the things that happen. Rather than um, observing directly in your own experience that there are many parts of the apparent I or me, it's not unified. Second, uh, it's not always the same, it's changing. You know, the self who sets the alarm clock to exercise is not the self who wakes up in the morning and goes, who set the damn clock, right? You've heard me say that probably. And then um, it's not independent, but in fact, the selfing is dependently originated. It arises dependent upon causes. Whoa, you can investigate quite profoundly that the three constituting conditions for the presumed self don't exist nor do they exist in the brain altogether. Whoa, that's an investigation. That's the fifth investigation. And then the sixth investigation, and we're moving farther and farther into the deep end of the pool, and I'm quite happy to talk with you about all this. And like I said, we are to investigate dhammas or dharmas. In Sanskrit is dharmas, Pali is dhammas. Kind of the tradition I'm in is more Pali-centered. Theravadan, so dhammas. In any case, uh, the dhammas are both phenomena and teachings about phenomena. So we draw on what the Buddha has taught. We draw on what great psychologists like Richard Schwartz and Carl Jung, although technically he's a psychiatrist, I'll, I'll let him in the club, Sigmund Freud, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, uh, we draw on their teachings, uh, draw on the teachings of science. We also observe phenomena, and I'm now moving through, I have been moving through uh, some of the major dhammas that the Buddha encouraged us to investigate, the major kinds of phenomena in our inner world and the major perspectives on those phenomena. So I'm kind of calling out some of the Buddha's greatest hits, <laughs> emphasizing these as things that we can engage in our practice. Okay, so number six, we can investigate the deep nature of all thoughts and things. Clinical psychology mainly investigates things or thoughts, you know, the stuff that appears in awareness. The Buddha mainly investigated the nature of the stuff appearing in awareness. Both are useful, and clearly, the investigation of the nature of the stuff appearing in awareness is a more fundamental investigation than investigating simply the stuff itself. And so what do we discover as we investigate the nature of all thoughts and all things? We increasingly become clear in real time that all phenomena, thoughts or things, have in common that they are made of parts that are connected and changing, and thus empty of self-existing identity, self-occurringness. They have a kind of dynamic, interdependent insubstantiality. Now, why do we do that? Well, to get an A on our philosophy paper, maybe, but so what? We investigate that because as the Buddha remarkably taught, one of his major original contributions were his teachings around emptiness and what makes things empty in their nature. Um, em they exist, but emptily. Uh, is that as we recognize the uh, empty existingness of <laughs> phenomena, we realize it's impossible to hold on to them. It's impossible to possess them. And then it, certainly it's impossible to do that with experiences. And that shifts our relationship to all of our experiences. We lighten up about them. We get less possessive. We get less entangled in them. We don't solidify them so much. We're, we feel lighter and we become lighter in our relationship to things. Sure, this side of complete irrevocable through and through awakening, uh, we can still get triggered. I got triggered the other day. It took a while for the cortisol to metabolize for me. Um, you know, yeah, but we're much 
harder to trigger. It took a lot to get me this time. And um, it uh, we recover much more rapidly. And even if some of the stuff in awareness is anger, hurt, you know, adrenaline activation in the body, cortisol activation in the body, even if that's some of the stuff in awareness, there can still be that ongoing insight as a kind of field or ground that recognizes that even this that seems so compelling and so personal and so important isn't. It's there. It's it's not to be suppressed, it's to be held with compassion, it's to be reflected upon, it's simultaneously as appropriate as I did to behave in ways that, in which you stick up for yourself and have boundaries and act skillfully and all that that's there. But meanwhile, there can be a, a, a recognition and in, based on investigation that the, the nature of the mind is open and empty. which then takes us to the seventh investigation, which was described by the Buddha mainly through negation. It's an investigation of what is not yet conditioned, what is not yet <clears throat> fabricated, constructed, made in the mind or in materiality, in nama or in rupa, in Sanskrit, in effect, uh, what is not yet conditioned, and therefore what is not yet in time, what is not yet therefore subject to decay, impermanence, and passing away, and therefore what is the ultimate island in a river of suffering, what is the ultimate refuge, the stainless, deathless, unconditioned, the farthest shore. Words break down because words are conditioned. Words point to conditioned phenomena, generally speaking. Um, this final investigation is the hardest to pin down. Um, for some, it's an investigation of God. They would use that languaging. For others, it's, it's an investigation of mystery. Um, others might use language like it's an investigation of potentiality in which actuality occurs. For others, they would just say, no, there ain't no such thing. It's all just the Big Bang universe unfolding in a clockwork way. Deal with it. I've had major Dharma teachers say that to me. Okay. But I think the Buddha encouraged us to investigate what is not conditioned. And... Um, Certainly many other great teachers and many other traditions encourage us to, to look there as well. And one way into this that I talk about in my book, Neurodharma, and I'll finish on this point, uh, is that we can investigate what is like ultimately unconditioned, what is like transcendentally unconditioned, like the unconditioned, currently unconditioned uh, field of possibility in a blank sheet of paper onto which we could put an infinite variety of things. The paper, yeah, is conditioned, comes from trees and blah, blah. But if you understand what I'm saying here, it's a field of, of unconditioned representational possibility. The field of awareness is much the same. And the field of awareness as, a, as, a, as an effectively unconditioned space in which experiences can occur can draw us in to a growing felt sense or growing intuition of or intimation of that which is ultimately unconditioned, in which conditioned reality and conditioned phenomena unfold. Okay. So, to summarize, the Buddha taught the Kalamas, investigate. Look for yourself, find for yourself, learn for yourself. 
And then on the basis of that, act for yourself. So what do we investigate? One, we can investigate the, the range and the depth of just our ordinary mind. What's there? The different thoughts, the different feelings, the different dynamics, the layers, just self-awareness, deepening self-awareness. Great. Second, we can investigate uh, what is enjoyable, what is painful, what is sweet and tender and beautiful, what is harsh, abrasive, metallic, and you know, sharp-edged. We can investigate those qualities, those different aspects in our experience. Third, we can investigate change, dynamism, impermanence, processes, fluidity. And we can, in that investigation, by the way, give ourselves the blessing, the gift of letting ourselves be more of a process, not so pinned to a certain personality or certain way of being. We can give ourselves more room to breathe, more flexibility, all right? In, a, in part as a result of becoming more and more aware of dynamism, change, process. Third investigation. Fourth investigation, causes and effects. What, you know, what makes it better, what makes it worse? <laughs> you do this, what happens then? You do that, oh, what goes better? Cause and effect. Uh, very, very fruitful investigation. Uh, at the heart of which is the investigation of craving. The fundamental cause, rooted in an even deeper cause of ignorance, uh, as the Buddha taught, that is the engine of so much suffering and harm. Okay, causes and effects. Craving more, less cra more craving, less craving. Uh, what are the results? Or as uh, Dr. Phil puts it, so how's that working for you? Fifth investigation on the next page. The fifth investigation: the apparent self. Can you find the actual presumed self in its full manifestation? What leads the apparent self to increase or decrease? And what is it like to stand up for yourself as a person while taking life less personally? Investigating that. Sixth investigation, uh, the deep nature of all thoughts and things as made of parts that are connected and changing. They have the nature of impermanence, the nature of interdependence, and um, the nature of compoundedness. And then what happens when you recognize that everything has that nature, including your mind and your very self, your very being, has that nature of emptiness, existent emptiness, emptily existing. And investigate the sense of freedom and release that brings you. This is the deep end of the pool. And it's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's clear and it's warm. And then last, deepest of all, investigating that which is not yet conditioned, that which is not fabricated, that which is not subject to arising and passing away. In other words, that which is timeless, eternal, the ground of the ground of all. Can we open to that mystery? Can we open to that possibility? And can we can we bring that element into our practice as I believe clearly the Buddha taught? Okay. So I hope you've been investigating what it's like to hear this talk about investigation. And I see, let's see, I see some people have removed their hands because maybe your hands were raised earlier. Uh, I'm not sure I'll have time here to take a person in question, but I'll definitely respond to the to the chat. Um, let's see. Investigate the investigator. Extremely good, Elaine. 23 minutes past the hour. Uh, investigating awareness. People do that. Uh, my friend um, Mark Coleman just did a program in which he was invest a teaching in which he was investigating awareness. Sure. And um, in yeah, and investigating whether personal awareness edges into something infinite. Uh, all right, let me just see here.
Um, Nancy asked that 18 minutes after the hour, does Vipassana meditation lead it, lend itself more to investigation than, than other types of in meditation? Uh, I'm aware of multiple forms of inquiry, which is a kind of investigation, like Ramana Maharshi talked about, you know, investigating who am I? Uh, Sri Nisargada Maharaj encourage those kind of investigations. There are other investigations as well. I dimly recall reading Tales of Power, Carlos Castaneda and all the rest of that. There were investigations there. So investigation is you know, not original to Buddhism. Uh, Vipassana tends to look extremely acutely with a magnifying glass at the actual granular nature of experiences as transient, compounded, um, interdependent, dependently arising and therefore selfless and ownerless. Uh, so I think Vipassana has a lot of tools, particularly as elaborated in the Theravadan tradition in Southeast Asia. Uh, analytic tools like the Abhidhamma. Um, I will say that um, as many other teachers uh, have encouraged, uh, it's, it's possible to get pretty dry and analytical in this minutia of discernment. And at a certain point, you ask yourself, um, is the acuity of my vipassana liberating my heart? And, you know, as Tara Brock said to me, when I kind of let put my practice uh, at her feet uh, some time ago, she said, well, Rick, you have a, you know, a lot of, a lot of presence and emptiness, a lot of recognition of emptiness. Can you now moisten the emptiness? Whoa. <laughs> Can you moisten the emptiness? you insightful vipassana person, you. Okay, so let's see here. Ah, I'm seeing very good notes. Thank you from Mira and others. Um, very, very interesting. So Mary D makes a very important point. It's 16 minutes past the hour, uh, which others have made, you know, in the kind of summary you may have heard, you need to be somebody before you can be nobody in a healthy sense. And in developmental psychology, it's really important for young children to develop a fairly coherent sense of selfness. On the other hand, I think that it's possible to cultivate a sense of personness that does not seem so contracted and reified, thingified, as you know, a very common developmental trajectory. And uh, that all said, you know, by the time somebody gets into adolescence, I suspect that the self-preoccupation of a lot of adolescents, me included, you know, with body and am I, you know, this or that, is my body this or that, how do people think about me this or that, you know, it's just sort of self-absorbed, self-referential, often kind of egocentric self-preoccupations not very healthy and major factors of some of the mental health issues adolescents have. Uh, so, you know, helping, the paradox here is that a major pathway, I think definitely one of the top three pathways for releasing the self-contraction is to love the person. To love the person over there and to love the person over here. And in love, I mean broadly to care for and to appreciate and to protect, stand up for and nourish, cherish persons as persons are cherished and nourished and protected and treated with justice in society, self-contraction relaxes and releases because the self-contraction a lot evolved in the evolution of our species to possess and protect and control and dominate. And when the urgency to do that falls away, in part because of creating societal conditions that are, that are just and compassionate, well, then there's less and less need for that contraction of the apparent self. And that's true in adolescence, certainly, and it's true in adulthood. And we can do a lot of reparative work with ourselves and with others by you know, on our own, I mean, offering to others the seeing of them as beings and the loving of them 
and internalizing for ourselves, feeling cared about, feeling appreciated, feeling like we matter, and and even independent of the regard of any other person or being, um, finding inside ourselves our own inherent goodness, our own inherent good intentions, good heartedness, sincerity, sweetness of being. Really important. Easy to push away in these sort of ascetic traditions, but extremely important. Well, so we've come. We've come to the to the end here. And I would just like to be with you for the last minute to just kind of let it all sink in. Covered a lot of ground. I gave you a list. Any one of those is useful to investigate. Um, I'll give you one suggestion in particular that um, is close to my heart and uh, is not on the list. <laughs> This week, uh, or actually over the next two weeks, because we'll have a guest teacher next week, Linda Graham, who's quite well known to many of you as someone who guest taught for me a lot when we were first starting out and uh, hasn't come to this gathering very often. Wonderful teacher, deep being. Anyway, but for the next week or the next two weeks, investigate what is good about you. Now, you may feel so embarrassed about this that you don't want to tell a soul you're doing it. But will you for me? Will you for yourself, for others? Investigate what is good about you. And I think you'll find in your investigation that as you actually do this, any little bit of arrogance or preening or pompousness will tend to fall away. Because as you really investigate what is good about yourself, all that stuff is unnecessary. Will you? Investigate this week and even next week till I see you in two weeks. What is good about you?